ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Alhamdulillah, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what the hearts conceal and what the tongues will not reveal, the one to whom all shall appeal and in front of whom the believers kneel. Uh, we're back with our usual uh, Q&A on Tuesday and today we have a number of questions, so let us begin with our first question. Uh, Sister Rupa from New Jersey uh, emails and asks uh, a question that should be pertinent to every single uh, lady and it is a question about uh, the menstrual cycle. And the issue is a very technical one, and that is that uh, at the beginning and end of the menstrual cycle, generally speaking, uh, the salah is sometimes not prayed, and sometimes when the menses finish, then uh, there's time left uh, to pray, and sometimes the sisters delay, and sometimes they do the ghusl immediately. So she's asking about the technical uh, question about the beginning of the menses, if it comes, let's say, after Salat al-Dhuhr, and she hasn't prayed dhuhr and her menses start. Must she make up salat al-dhuhr? And then also when the menses finish and it finishes at the time of dhuhr and asr, let's say, but for whatever reason she's in school or whatever, she delays it and then it's after asr, you know, what is to be done? So the salahs that need to be made up uh, at the beginning and at the end of the menses, that is the question. Now realize the topic of, of menstruation is of course uh, uh, integral to uh, tahara and to purity and there's a lot of rulings and uh, honestly there's a lot of confusion as well that a lot of our sisters have and maybe inshallah you know one day um, uh, I'll give a more detailed class. Uh, it's something that actually there should not be that much confusion um, about uh, and one of the areas of confusion is uh, the, the notion of making up the salawat. Uh, and what needs to be done. Now obviously, we are not talking about the prayers that are happening during the menstruation by unanimous consensus. The days that she is menstruating, those days she does not pray and she does not make up those prayers. That is by unanimous consensus, there is no difference of opinion. The issue comes about a prayer she might have missed at the very beginning of the menses and or the prayers that uh, technically she could have prayed, uh, but for whatever reason she did not do ghusl, or even if she did ghusl, uh, so the question arises, what if she did ghusl uh, after Salat al-Asr? Must she also make up dhuhr and asr or only asr? So that's the area. So let us begin with the first um, issue, which is the uh, question of when the menses begin, and if she did not pray that particular prayer. Now obviously there are uh, two simple scenarios. The first scenario, uh, Salat al-Dhuhr, the timing came, or Salat al-Maghrib, or Isha, whatever it is, and she prayed the prayer. And then her menses start. No problem here, obviously she's done her duty, she has done her salah, and therefore obviously there is no question that there is no salah that she needs to make up. But what if, she uh, did not pray because obviously no, no, no sister knows the minute that is going to start, obviously. So she did not pray because she's allowed to delay. It's Dhuhr is at 1.30, Asr is at 4 o'clock. And you know, she thought, okay, I'm gonna pray in an hour. And lo and behold, her menses began uh, and uh, she did not pray Dhuhr. So obviously she is you know, not, uh, not liable for having delayed Dhuhr, but the question is, is she liable to make up Salat al-Dhuhr? And the other question that comes that, well, how about Dhuhr and Asr together? Because if she were traveling or if circumstances were dire, then Dhuhr and Asr can be combined and Maghrib and Isha can be combined. So do we take into account the direness, if you like, of the, 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 the issue of the possibility of combining uh, the two prayers? And must she make up the one prayer or maybe even the both uh, prayers. So this is the uh, question over here. And the scholars of the madhahib have differed over this issue. And uh, some of the madhahib say that if there was time to pray, even if it was time to pray one rak'ah, and the point is there has to be at least one rak'ah time. So if dhuhr began at let's say 1.30 p.m. and you know we happen to know 1.31, you know, she began the menses. So in reality, she did not have any time to even pray a full uh, rak'ah. So in that case, obviously she is forgiven. But if she had enough time to pray a full rak'ah, uh, then 
the majority of scholars say that she should make up that one prayer that she did not pray, uh, that that's time was there. She's not sinful, but she is liable to make it up because they say, they look at it this way, that when the time of prayer came in, she was obliged to pray. The fact that she delayed the prayer is her choice. And she's not sinful because she didn't realize that the menses would start. But she still had the obligation to pray for that hour or hour and a half or 35 minutes. So the fact that her menses began simply means she needs to make up what was obligatory on her during that, you know, 35 minutes or hour and a half before the menses uh, began. And this is the uh, position of the majority of the madhahib. However, the, the Maliki school and also Shaykh Rasam ibn Taymiyyah, uh, they argue that there is no qada upon her at all. And that is because the obligation to pray uh, last throughout the entire section of the prayer. And the fact that that obligation was lifted by her menses in the middle means according to them that the entire obligation was negated. So the point is that, uh, is the obligation incremental? Let me put it that way, that is it obligatory every single millisecond or is it like the entire duration? So if it is a chunk, the entire duration, and it was lifted up in the middle of that duration, then she is not liable. And uh, one can also add over here that that, you know, uh, plenty of women, uh, obviously every woman menstruated in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and he did not uh, speci specifically command them to make up uh, this particular prayer. And therefore, uh, it makes sense, like Ibn Taymiyyah argues, that it makes sense that, uh, you know, the fact that she delayed it, it was her choice, okay? And so, uh, the, no, none of the Sahabiyat were explicitly told by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that, hey, monitor your menses when they begin and make sure that you make up any salah that, uh, uh, you didn't pray uh, uh, when the menses began. So Allah knows best, but uh, you know the, the, the position of Ibn Taymiyyah here does make sense to me. Nonetheless, the majority position is that she does make up. And in fact, many of the scholars say, and this is a well-known position within the Hanbali school, that she makes up uh, if uh, it was at Dhuhr time, uh, or if it was at Maghrib time, uh, then she makes up the two prayers, Dhuhr and Asr, or Maghrib and Isha, because they argue, and again, this is a very, you know, that position that they're arguing is actually very consistent with uh, uh, yeah, the, the paradigm of uh, understanding the obligation of Salah. But you see the flip side is, this is a scenario that a lot of women would have faced. And you would have thought that such a, uh, a common scenario should not have been left silent. Okay, so if you look at it from the perspective of, of you know, technical usul al-fiqh, frankly, the majority position makes a lot of sense. And there's no question that is a safer opinion. And that is that she should make up the prayer. And in fact, she should make up two prayers in case Dhuhr and Asr were both together and her menses started at uh, Dhuhr. And Maghrib and Isha and her menses started after Maghrib. Obviously, once again, if her menstruation began before, obviously, the prayer, there's no question that it's not obligatory. So if the menses began, uh, the, the, the cycle began after uh, Asr, but before Maghrib, then obviously Maghrib and Isha is forgiven. But the question is Asr, that's the question. And then if it was after Dhuhr, then the question is Dhuhr and Asr, because according to uh, that paradigm, Dhuhr and Asr, they occupy like one status uh, in times of, of, of hardship or need. And Maghrib and Isha, they occupy one status. Because again, when we're traveling or, you know, in times of difficulty, you know, or in times of rain, uh, the Prophet would combine those two salawat. It was something that was done in exceptional scenarios. And this can be considered an exceptional scenario. So these are the two opinions. The safer one is that she makes up. Uh, and uh, inshallah ta'ala, if you ask me, uh, what I say is that she does not need to make up any prayer uh, uh, of the beginning uh, because she did not intentionally, I mean, it's not like you're not delaying, you know, in order to, you know, nobody knows when the menses will begin. And so if it has begun, the, the obligation has been lifted uh, because she was allowed to delay. There's no sin on her to delay. And then if the menses began, then there is no problem and she does not need to make it up. Okay, that is the beginning uh, of the uh, cycle. How about the end of the cycle? And the end of the cycle, of course, is no by the uh, special discharge called the whitest discharge with which uh, you know the average uh, menstruating sister or lady has obviously there are exceptional scenarios and that requires a longer class of fiqh obviously but um, uh, generally speaking uh, most ladies that particular discharge finishes uh, the monthly cycle and that signifies that it is time of purity now point here 
is that many, many of our women, may Allah guide us uh, and forgive us for our sins, many of our sisters uh, do not understand the importance of performing ghusl immediately. And unfortunately, all too often, they simply delay it for a few hours, thinking that, oh, okay, it's okay, I'm in my menses, so you know, might as well just delay. But you see, uh, that's something that obviously no, no scholar has allowed because uh, it, it goes against, the, the point is your menses have finished. And when they have finished, you need to do a ghusl and you need to uh, pray. And so the question therefore is that if a sister uh, finishes her cycle, the, the, the discharge comes out at the time of, let us say, now obviously if it comes out at the time of, of Dhuhr, obviously, uh, let's say Dhuhr is 1.30 and she finishes at 2 o'clock. Obviously, we all understand that she needs to do a ghusl and she needs to pray dhuhr. If she was lazy or if circumstances forced her for whatever reason that, you know, she's not going to be, uh, you know, taking the ghusl, it doesn't matter, dhuhr is obligatory on her and she is going to pray dhuhr, we all understand that, no problem. Now, the, the, however, the, the technical controversy is the following. What if her mens is finished after asr? The same scenario. Must she make up both dhuhr and asr or only asr? Again, by unanimous consensus in the time slot that her white is discharged uh, uh, takes place, and if there was enough time for her to pray even one rak'ah. Okay, so let me give you a simple example. Uh, that suppose Maghrib is on the dot 6 p.m. let's say, and she sees that uh, her, her, mens her white is discharged comes out at 5.55 uh, p.m. So her menses has finished, now she does not technically have the time to do a ghusl, full ghusl, and then to pray. That would be almost impossible. But five minutes is enough to pray a rak'ah. Therefore, if she is not able to do a full ghusl immediately and pray, dhuh, I'm sorry, asr is still obligatory on her. So she will pray it uh, as soon as she does the ghusl and she comes out and she is now fully uh, purified. She will first start with asr, even if it is past maghrib time. Why? Because the mens is finished in enough time for her to pray one rak'ah of asr before the time of maghrib. So I hope that that is clear. We do not look at the time frame of after ghusl. We look at the time frame of after the menses, knowing full well that she cannot pray after the menses until she does ghusl. But the ghusl time frame is not looked at. We look at that time frame. Now she is excused if she needs to take ghusl and because of that, the time goes out. That is a legitimate excuse, but the obligation to pray is still binding on her. So if she could have prayed one rak'ah before the entrance of the next time frame. So suppose again, Maghrib is at 6 p.m., 5.55 she finishes. And so she uh, she rushes to the shower, it's gonna take three, four, five, ten minutes, you know, to take the shower. And then she comes out and she dresses and she prays. She will begin with Asr, even though it is Maghrib time. But Asr is binding on her. She's not sinful, but she must make it up. And then she will pray Maghrib. So that much should be clear. And that is really no controversy amongst uh, the scholars in that regard. She is sinful if she delays without a legitimate uh, cause. If she is sinful, if she is lazy and says, oh, uh, my, my, my discharge comes out, let's say at 3 p.m. and she just, oh, I'm gonna watch another serial drama, I'm gonna do this and that, and she delays and she misses Asr and maybe Maghrib and then before going to sleep, she might do a, a ghusl and they say, I'll pray Fajr the next day because hey, I missed the whole day. No, she is liable for that uh, delay and she needs to make, a, of course, she's sinful for that delay in the first place if it's without, you know, if it's within her control and she is liable to make up all of the uh, salawat. Now, the other issue that comes though is the more technical one and that is that in case her whitest discharge was released after Asr or after Isha. These are the two time slots where we have to ask the, answer this question. Otherwise, we don't have to answer this question. If uh, the discharge was released after Asr or after Isha, then the question is, must she also make up Dhuhr and or Maghrib? I hope you understand the question, right? Because obviously, uh, you know, you understand that if the discharge were to come out at any other time, then we don't have this question or scenario. If it comes out after uh, the sun rises, but before Dhuhr, no problem. If it comes out uh, right after Fajr and you still have time, no problem, you only have Fajr Salah. And if it comes out after Dhuhr or after Maghrib, you only have that one Salah and then the next one you'll pray. The, 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 the controversy will come that if it comes after Asr or after Isha, does she have to make up the preceding prayer based on the same issue of the combination of the uh, prayers? And uh, in this case, 
in this case, uh, you have the Hanafi school and also many of the, the uh, uh, independent scholars, including my own teacher, Ibn Uthaymeen, uh, they said that she only needs to make up the one prayer that is in its time frame. Okay, uh, that she needs to make up only the one prayer that is in its time frame. So if she finished after Asr, she only makes up Asr. She does not have to go back to Dhuhr. And the same goes for Isha. And uh, they use the similar reasoning that I used in the previous part about, uh, once again, the, it's not her fault and uh, the Sharia didn't come explicitly to mention that. Uh, the majority of scholars, however, say that she should make up both because again, they're looking at it as this is a constrained uh, time for her but the Sharia puts these two salawat together. So the Sharia time slot for Dhuhr Asr is basically one, and Maghrib Isha is basically one. So they have uh, an argument from an usul al-fiqh perspective. And again, logically and rationally, uh, I have to say that it makes a lot of sense, yet textually, uh, the other one makes the sense. It should also be added that there are a number of companions, uh, um, uh, uh, Ibn Abbas, um, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, a number of companions, a number of tabi'un, they were asked the exact same question and they said she should make up Dhuhr and Asr or she should make up Maghrib and Isha. So based upon that, the majority of madhabs do go with that. And there's no question to your brothers and sisters that it is the safer opinion. And it is a position that will get you out of any uh, controversy. And I you know, recommend that uh, just to be on the safe side. Uh, nonetheless, Allah Azza wa knows best, but um, if a sister only makes up the, the, the salah that is in her time slot and she does not make up the salah that she missed when her menses began, inshallah ta'ala, in my opinion, uh, she is not uh, sinful and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Our next question, uh, sister, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Irnis from Bosnia, mashallah tabarakallah, uh, she emails and uh, she says that, she has read an article uh, in some uh, a magazine that uh, a painting has been discovered by humans in a cave that goes back 45,000 years. Then she says, but does this not clash with our belief that Adam uh, was around 6,000 years uh, ago from our time? So this is a question that deals with chronology. It deals with time frames, and she is asking a question that there seems to be a conflict between uh, the the uh, archaeological evidence for the existence of mankind and the notion that we have been on this earth for six thousand years. So, with regards to the archaeological evidence, uh, it does appear to be pretty conclusive. There are multiple genres of evidences, not just one evidence. There are multiple, you know, um, uh, areas, if you like, of study that demonstrate that our species of mankind, of human beings, our particular species, we're not talking about Cro-Magnon or Neanderthal or Homo erectus or Homo habilis, we're talking about actual us as Homo sapiens, our species, uh, it has been around for at least 50, 60,000 years. At the very least, this is like, now this is pretty much definitive in terms of, again, so much, uh, so many evidences. You have only brought one evidence, which is uh, paintings in a cave. And uh, there are paintings in multiple areas, uh, a famous cave in France uh, that was covered up uh, and basically left untouched for 25,000 years. Uh, that uh, um, it was discovered only a few years ago uh, because of a certain uh, crevice that opened up and you find paintings that can be easily carbon-14 dated and handprints and you can put your hand and there are modern archaeologists that have put their hand next to the original and it is exactly the same this is human beings and you see art I mean you know no other species is drawing art other than us you know so you see art of an animal you see recognizable animals that we recognize that would have been around uh, you know um, 45,000 years ago as well the Aborigines um, uh, in Australia, there is evidence that they have been there for around 40,000 years. There's archaeological evidence, bones and whatnot. So, and, and, and the Aborigines are of the most ancient of all races that have been cut off from the mainstream of humanity. And so quite a lot of research has been done on them, their genetic structures and whatnot. And uh, other things also point to uh, mankind having been on this earth for, as I said, at least 50, 40 to 50,000, if not more. Some have posited uh, even a few more um, uh, uh, millennia than this. But the point being, yes, it is pretty definitive. Now, the next thing you mentioned is that Adam alayhi salam existed 6,000 years ago. And this is where we say, where did you get this number from? Because we firmly believe that there cannot be a actual clash between definitive science and between 
explicit and authentic scripture. There cannot be an actual clash between something that is certain and something that is clear cut from observable science and phenomenon and uh, uh, something that is in the Quran or authentic Sunnah that is uh, clear in meaning. Why? Because the Quran is from Allah and our creation is also, Allah is our creator. And so to Allah belongs the creation and the command. So the creation is the world around us and the command is the Quran and the speech of Allah. So when the both of them come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the one of them is created and the other is uncreated, then how can there be a conflict between the two, we believe firmly there can never be a definitive conflict. If there is, it is a perceived one in our minds and we need to work out how to reconcile. And in this particular case, uh, we say that this 6,000 time frame that you are coming from, in reality, it is not based on any Islamic sources. It is coming from Judeo-Christian sources. We as Muslims do not believe necessarily that Adam alayhi salam existed uh, 6,000 years ago. Rather, this is something that some segments of Judaism and in particular Orthodox Judaism, and of course they have a calendar by the way, like we have the Hijri calendar and the Christians have their Gregorian uh, calendar uh, and uh, other civilizations have their calendars. Uh, the Jewish people have their calendar and in their calendar, uh, they date the beginning of their calendar from the time of Adam alayhi salam. That is their mythology. And according to them, uh, our year is 2021 in the Gregorian uh, and uh, meaning the, not ours, meaning ours, the Western civilization and theirs, uh, the Jewish civilization, their year is 5,781. So we are currently in the year 5781. So according to the Jewish calendar, Adam existed 5,781 years ago. However, that is something that is found in their sources. We do not have to have this particular uh, time frame. And in fact, we are not bound by any dates. And therefore, as Muslims, we say that we do not have a theological chronology. We don't have a calendar or a time frame that we are bound to believe in. And so people are free to believe whatever they want from a Islamic perspective. So if somebody for whatever reason wants to believe 6,000, that's their prerogative. We don't, not, nobody's saying that as a Muslim, Islam tells us to do that. And if somebody says, well, science tells us that we've been for 50,000 years, so we're gonna have to extrapolate Adam to be back uh, 50,000 years or whatever, that too is permissible. The Sharia does not, uh, does not have any numbers when it comes to dates. So Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah that there is no actual conflict between uh, the chronology of science in this regard and the chronology of theology because we do not have this. In fact, in my other lectures, I have actually um, uh, mentioned that uh, we actually might have some evidence to indicate that the 6,000 does not make any sense. And of them is the, uh, it is a hadith, even though it is very weak, some have said uh, batil, uh, that uh, it is alleged that our Prophet said, uh, most likely this might be Ibn Abbas, but it is alleged that our Prophet uh, would stop uh, his nasab or his lineage when he gets to Adnan. And Adnan is 20 generations before the Prophet and then he would not go beyond this. And there is a report that he would say, nasabun, that the scholars of lineage are lying or mistaken. They do not know uh, who is before Adnan because Allah says in the Quran, وَقُرُونًا بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا This is Surah Furqan, verse 38. This is a key verse. Now, the hadith, might be from Ibn Abbas. Uh, it's not from the Prophet system. It's actually, it's ascribed to him in the books, but in reality, it has people in the chain that uh, make us say that it's not authentic. In fact, it might be batil or maybe even uh, mawdur. Uh, but it, it might be from uh, a tabi'i or, or maybe even Ibn Abbas. And the concept of, we don't know who is beyond Adnan, this is an authentic concept. By the way, who is Adnan? Adnan is the father of one of the main two branches of the Arabs. The Arabs were two main branches. We can very simplistically say Middle uh, Arabia and South Arabia. And you had Adnan and Qahtan to be these two major uh, players that were roughly the same uh, time frame. And it is considered, uh, the Arabs would consider that the descendants of both Adnan and Qahtan, these are what make all of the Arab tribes. So all of the Arab tribes were divided into Adnani or Qahtani. 
and our Prophet ﷺ was an Adnani. Uh, and Adnan was of the descendants of Ismail. And Ismail was of the descendants of Nuh. And Nuh was of the descendants of uh, Adam alayhi salam. However, the, 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 the names of the individuals between Adam and Nuh, and between Nuh and Ibrahim, and between Ibrahim and Adnan, this is something that we do not know. Now you will find charts in many Muslim households, in many Sira books, you will find charts that have names, but we do not know. We do know for certain pretty much, the history is pretty clear, uh, up to Adnan, uh, because uh, the, the, the Arabs documented their tribes. The Arabs documented uh, the founders, and so you know who is Quraysh, you know, um, uh, and uh, the the descendants of Quraysh and the uh, ancestors of Quraysh all the way to Adnan. However, between Adnan and Ismail, we do not know how many. And Ismail is the son of Ibrahim. Between Ibrahim and Nuh, some reports mention ten. But in reality, these do not go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we do not have to believe in them. And also between Nuh and Adam, some reports again mention 10, but these are not a hadith. And this is like, you know, people of the past, maybe even a companion speaking. And so this is not something that we have to necessarily believe in. And we do not know, therefore, how many generations existed. And, and in fact, it doesn't make sense for Allah to use, this, uh, use the term kathira. Allah is saying lots of generations between them. And this is in the Quran, Surah Furqan, uh, verse 38. And if you look at these charts, you find that there's only 10 or, or uh, you know, uh, people between uh, Ibrahim and, and, uh, and um, uh, Nuh and Nuh and, and Adam. Just 10 is not kathir. Kathira, 10 is not that much that Allah is saying there were many generations between them. For Allah to say many, it does not make sense that there's only uh, 10. And in fact, we have other you know, evidences that might indicate this of them, is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent 124,000 prophets, 124,000 prophets. We know this from the ahadith. Now, the names of these prophets and their stories, and even from common knowledge of history, we don't know from our Quran and Sunnah, we know around 25. And we can add another 20 or so names that we're not certain about from the Old Testament because the Old Testament mentions, you know, some of the prophets that were between uh, uh, Sulaiman, uh, between Musa and between Isa. Uh, the Old Testament mentions all of the names of the prophets. So we can say, okay, this is what they know and it's not something we need to accept or to reject. But still, the grand total that we would be able to get is less than, let's say, 50 names, okay? And that's from including sources that are dubious because the 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 the, the um, Judeo-Christian sources, we don't have to believe in them, but we can narrate them. So, 120,000 prophets, and we do not even have knowledge of the majority of them. The only way to explain this would be to extrapolate the beginning of mankind to many, many, many thousands of years ago, and then to posit that there were prophets that came in antiquity, there was no rec rec record, there was no writing, because again, reading and writing is something that very, very recently has been uh, invented. Allah bless mankind with that. Otherwise, uh, for most of human history, uh, writing did not exist. Uh, and even paintings were rare, but they were there. They could draw, but they, the concept of writing and, and speech being written down and recorded in alphabets or hierographics, this is something that is relatively very, very, very recent in human uh, history. Only goes back, uh, uh, you know, we actually have records uh, maybe 2,000, 3,000, the very most to have some things here. So in reality, uh, we don't have, and of course that even those, by the way, hylographics is not the type of writing that we do. It's basically symbol writing. So the point being that one of the ways to interpret and explain this would be to extrapolate the time frame. And another hadith that might indicate that the times are much beyond what we can comprehend is the famous hadith in Muslim Muhammad and its, its basis is also in Bukhari and others and this version is in, in multiple books that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation, uh, when Allah created Adam, He extracted from Adam all of the souls of Adam. And he showed Adam all of these souls in front of him. And Adam saw the brightness. Some were brighter than others and some were darker. This is the nur, nur of Iman. So Adam was particularly drawn to one particular light. He was drawn to one particular uh, uh, light. And Adam said, who is this, O Allah? Who is this that I can see a brightness coming from his forehead? 
and Allah Azza wa Jal says, this is one of the last of the generations of your descendants by the name of Dawood. Okay, هَذَا رَجُلٌ مِنْ آخِرِ الْأُمَمِ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِكَ this is a man from the very last of your generations by the name of Dawood. And then the hadith goes on that, that Adam gifted Dawood 40 years of his own life, right? So Adam was initially des destined to live a thousand years and he gifted 40 to uh, his son Dawood. So when the angel of death came at 960 years, uh, Adam had forgotten that he had given uh, 40 and he denied it and Allah gifted him another uh, 40. Uh, but uh, the point is that he had gifted 40 to Dawood alayhi salam. Now, the point being that the interesting phrase that we have over here is that uh, Allah Azza wa says to, Dawood, to, to, to Adam, this is Dawood who shall come in the very end of times. Now, for us, we think of Dawood as living in ancient times, okay? From our perspective, Dawood is the very beginnings, you know, of humanity, right? I mean, I'm being a little bit stretching, but you get my point here, right? We, we think Dawood is long, long time ago, even though, of course, you know, technically, uh, he might have been uh, uh, 2,000 years from now, okay? So, 1,000-something uh, BC, 900-something BC is Dawood. So, from our time frame, okay, uh, sorry, 3,000 uh, 3, years from now, 3,000 years in the past. Now, so from our time frame, uh, Dawood is 3,000 years ago, okay? And that's way back. And in the hadith, we are told that Dawood is gonna be at the very end of times, which indicates from Adam to Dawood, is such a large time frame that Dawood is considered to be, now this, if we if it was 50,000 years, and Dawood is 3,000 years from now, right? Then we understand, 3,000 years ago, then we understand 50,000 years, and in the last 5,000 years, Allah knows when is the day of judgment, we ask Allah to uh, not to, um, have us alive when that happens, we don't wanna be there towards Akhir zaman but uh, things are happening and Allah knows how much time is left, you know? We're living closer and closer to Akhir zaman So the point being that, uh, once again, I hope you get what I'm saying here. If Dawood is Akhir zaman and Akhir umam then where are we? And it does indicate that between Adam and Dawood, is a far larger gap than a mere 2000 that the Jewish calendar would have posited. Because the Jewish calendar would say there's around 2000 between Adam and Dawood. And, and that means 4000 between us and, and Dawood, so, or 3000 between us and Dawood. So how then can Allah say that Dawood is the last of your um, of the last of your ummas? And he is in fact before even half of the 6000. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. So bottom line, that theologically, we have no obligation to believe in any number. And in fact, I argue that the Quran and Sunnah might even uh, indicate that 6,000 is a too small of a number. And that in fact, the, the, the notion of us having been here 50, 60,000 years actually makes more sense if you look at these other factors. And Allah says in the Quran that, you know, uh, some of the prophets we have told you their stories and some we haven't. مِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَصَصْنَا عَلَيْكَ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ لَمْ نَقْصُصْ عَلَيْكَ And so the majority of prophets, they are in such antiquity that we have no knowledge of them whatsoever. And therefore this explains uh, this large gap and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Our next question, uh, Brother Irfan uh, emails, location uh, not mentioned, uh, and he says that uh, he has a certain uh, uh, disfigurement that he was born with. He mentions it, um, I don't need to mention it in public, but he basically says that there is a, a condition that he was born with, a uh, slight disfigurement of the body, the physical body, and uh, this condition visible, it is a visible, uh, you know, um, aberration that it can be corrected via surgery. And he is asking that, is it permissible to undergo, he doesn't need it for life and death, his, his, he's able to live normally, but there is something about his appearance that can be, uh, it, it draws attention. And if he were to undertake this surgery, that it will change the appearance and it will uh, become uh, uh, better. And he is wondering that is this permissible because he has read in the Quran that shaitan has uh, uh, 
promised that he will delude mankind and he will change the creation of Allah. فَلَا يُغَيِّرُنَّ خَلْقَ اللَّهِ So this is why he is asking this question. The response to this question is that uh, there is no doubt that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind as a default to be uh, in perfect symmetry and perfect harmony. Allah says in the Quran that He created us fi ahsani taqweem, in the best of all manners. And Allah says, Sawarakum fa ahsana suwarakum. He shaped and fashioned you and He perfected that uh, fashioning. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna Allah Ta'ala Jameelun Yuhibbul Jamal. Allah Azza wa Jal is beautiful and He loves beauty. So there is no doubt that the default of how man has been created, the ideal man, the ideal woman, that it is something of beauty and of perfection. Uh, some people are born with different medical conditions, with different, you know, call them birth defects even, aberrations, abnormalities, and this is a test uh, for them and for those around them, and it is a means of raising their ranks as well. You see, anybody who has been tested with anything has the potential to gain much more than anybody else who has not been tested in that manner. And so we do not choose uh, the time of our birth and the family of our birth and our social upbringing. We do not choose the circumstances of our birth and what we have been gifted with of DNA and of wealth and heritage. It's all of Allah's qadr. And whatever Allah gives us, it is our test and trial. We are all being tested. Uh, we are all being tested, every one of us, but we're being tested in different ways. So I am being tested and you are being tested. And it is possible that, you know, in some ways my tests are easier and in some ways they're more difficult. And in other ways your tests are easier and in other ways your tests are more difficult. So of the things that Allah has tested is that some people are born very handsome or very beautiful. And that is a test from Allah. Our Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, he was tested by beauty. Frankly, how many of us would have been able to pass that test, right? So he was tested with beauty. And other people are tested with other issues uh, and others are tested with uh, uh, defects, if you like, or, or aberrations of this nature. And if that is the case, then if they're able to, obviously if they're not able to change, uh, for whatever reason, pre-modernity, or, or if it's a condition that cannot be changed, then we, we can only advise them to be patient and uh, expect Allah's reward and Allah Azza wa will reward them. But the question arises, what if they can be changed? What if uh, you're, you're, you're able to correct? These days, science has progressed, technology has progressed, uh, you know, surgeries are now, you know, amazing things can be done. And much of what was considered to be impossible even a few decades ago is now standard and uh, the norm. Uh, simple example is the, the cleft, you know, that uh, some, some children are born and they have an opening here in the cleft uh, of their lips and they cannot smile. And a simple surgery that literally costs dollars, literally it costs dollars, that it can be put together and it ap ap appear to be normal. With respect to such operations and surgeries, there is pretty much no difference of opinion uh, that it is permissible to undertake such corrective procedures with some very simple conditions. And of them is that uh, there is no you know, danger to the life or whatnot that the person understands you know, the risks um, and the risks uh, are trivial compared to the positives that obviously qualified people do it and that nothing haram is done to you know, uh, during that procedure. So again, very generic, basic, base. essentially it is permissible to undertake corrective procedures to overcome a birth defect or even an acquired defect. For example, it is possibly, Allah protect all of us, but somebody might have a disease that will actually, you know, something will happen, an appendage will come out or, uh, you know, some type of, you know, uh, may Allah protect us, a cancer or a growth. Can we not remove that? We should, we must, it is dawa. Or even if it's, you know, non-malignant, a tumor that's not gonna hurt or harm us, but it looks abnormal. Yes, bismillah, go ahead and remove it, no problem. Or some people have an accident, accident and scars or a burn happens, can they do skin grafting? Can they do something that will you know, make uh, their appearances uh, appear to be normal or as normal as possible? All of this, pretty much all the councils uh, that are active and most of the scholars that I'm aware of, in fact, I do not know of anybody who disagrees, but I mean, you know, the reality is that there might be somebody, but generally speaking, this is something that is across the board that corrective procedures are permissible. And the evidences for this are numerous. Of them are the generic a hadith uh, uh, and, and verses in this regard. And of them is the principle of fiqh. Uh, there's something called the, the qawa'id or the maxims of fiqh. And there are five in number. And one of them is 
الضرر يزال Harm is to be eliminated We get rid of harm And this is a harm And it should be eliminated This is something that is harming you It is making life awkward Nobody likes that, you know um, People are looking or uh, it's abnormal Marriage becomes problem Nobody likes this It's something that is not, uh, you know Obviously conducive to one's mental health And therefore it is completely permissible In fact, it is also permissible to If need be And this is something that case by case basis That even if a, a, some amount of generally speaking haram needs to be done to obtain a great amount of halal actually it is permissible in some cases unlike what some of our innocent Muslims think that you can never do any amount of haram no we look at well, you're allowed to eat pork if you're gonna die right and again I'm giving a drastic example but the point being the principle of lesser of two evils applies and it is uh, mentioned uh, um, in the hadith in Abu Dawood and Muslim Imam Ahmad uh, by Arfaja uh, ibn As'ad that his grandfather uh, was, uh, he had a, a nose that had been chopped off uh, in the wars of the, called the, the, the wars of Kulab in the days of Jahiliyyah. So uh, he was in a battle in the days of Jahiliyyah and his entire nose had been chopped off. And obviously you can imagine the disfigurement. You can imagine, you know, looking at that and you feel nauseous or you feel, you know, very, very bad to look at that. And so uh, the, uh, he was allowed to make a nose straight out of silver and to wear a fake nose made out of silver. But that one, it spoiled. It didn't, you know, it didn't, you know, stick and it spoiled, it became rotten and so, the Prophet ﷺ allowed him to make a nose out of gold. This is a hadith in the Muslim Imam Ahmad and other books. The Prophet ﷺ allowed him to make a nose out of gold. So he would have a fake nose. Now you know it's fake, but at least looking at it, he looks more normal than if there was nothing over there. Now the point of this hadith is that as we are all aware, generally speaking, a man is not allowed to wear gold. In fact, it is something that we know is not allowed. And yet in this case, and by the way, this is not a life and death, he's not gonna die, but it looks very, very bad. And people are gonna stare. Now, having the gold, people are still gonna stare, but the disgust will be much less. He's gonna be much more normal, a prosthetic nose in place and using uh, actual gold, right? And so the process allowed him to do this. So this clearly demonstrates that it is permissible to undertake corrective surgery for aesthetic purposes. Aesthetic, because again, the nose was not a life and death for him, but it's a matter of looking. So if you are looking abnormal for whatever reason, uh, something has happened to you or even a birth defect, and there is a corrective procedure. A birth defect can be corrected. Any type of issue that can be brought back to normal, then insha'Allah ta'ala, by pretty much, you know, all of the scholarly uh, uh, bodies, you know, some, sometimes there's an extra finger, sometimes this and that, there's a, 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 an appendage that is there, a growth that is there, anything of this nature, corrective surgery, uh, you know, facial features are not normal, whatever, and you can correct them. So this is something that can be done no problem, insha'Allah ta'ala. So your question is easily answered. Now, the other part of this question that you did not ask, but it will come uh, because of this, I'm gonna just quickly go over this. What if everything is normal, you are a normal person, but you wanna do a surgery or a procedure simply to beautify yourself, okay? So you want to look better than you actually um, are. You're not satisfied with the shape of your nose. Okay, you're not satisfied with, you know, the size of a particular limb. Okay, you're not, you know, you want to look this or that. In this case, this is where we do find a much more uh, 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 scholarly difference of opinion, if you like. Corrective surgery, uh, remediation, uh, anything that you're making up, uh, covering up a fault, pretty much no problem, go ahead and get it done. To look normal, average like most people are because something has happened to you or you were born a certain way, we can cut a lot more slack. But if you're gonna open the door to beautification, if you're gonna open the door to permanent procedures simply because you are not satisfied with uh, the shape of your nose, as I said, okay? You're not satisfied with your facial structure, 
you're not satisfied with, you know, um, you know, ladies have certain things that they want to enhance or whatnot. And you want to do something just not because it's abnormal, not because it's something that is below average and people are going to, you know, uh, uh, not appreciate you as a human being. Like if some people are born, Allah has tested them, their face is disfigured or whatever, and surgeries can correct that. And they can look, you know, if not fully, but at least acceptable. That's no problem. But now, if you're going to open this door, then really that's that's uh, requires a longer discussion and uh, i don't want to go into a lot of detail because uh, i just wanted you to be aware that there are in fact uh, many many differences of opinion but generally speaking generally speaking the scholarly bodies the the, the councils of fiqh are more on the prohibitive side when it comes to beautification and they're more on the closing this door of uh, uh, of wanting to just change your, your your features simply because you want to look more handsome or more beautiful. And uh, the uh, International Islamic Fiqh Academy uh, in the year 2007, uh, it issued a fatwa uh, dated, uh, uh, sorry, number 173, 11-18. Uh, you can look this up. It's a very detailed fatwa. It's a lengthy fatwa, but the summary of it is that the, this is of course the International Islamic Fiqh Academy. This is one of the largest, you know, uh, academies, the Majma al Fiqh of the world, one of the largest in the world. They issued a detailed fatwa and they said that it is permissible to perform any surgery that is safe and whose effects will be minimally harmful if it is done to correct a defect or to better a look that is considered abnormal. Okay, regardless of whether one was born that way or acquired it due to a disease or because of an accident. So to correct a defect or to look normal from something that is abnormal. However, they said, surgeries that are done for the sake of beautification so that one can look like, you know, a, a model, uh, somebody that's, you know, different than, than, than them. They said that this would not be allowed and they explicitly mentioned uh, face enhancements and uh, you know breast procedures that women do and others they said this would not be allowed uh, because you're opening up the door for for evil for israf for vanity you're feeding your ego uh, you know you're becoming a bit narcissistic about obsessed with your looks to the point of it becoming unhealthy uh, and uh, they also said this is where the threat of shaitan would apply that i'm going to change the creation of allah because uh, shaitan uh, threatened and shaitan said as is in the quran that you just watch i'm going to make sure that they change the creation of allah so from this to bring about a permanent change. We're not talking about beautification of the clothes or beautification of, you know, a, a permanent change that is done to look, uh, for, I mean, again, for lack of a better word, you know, above average. You are average, you're okay. But now you want to start, and this, all of this, by the way, is relative, right? In one culture, in one society, average is something above average is something else. And so if you open this door, you're really going to, uh, you know, uh, go down uh, a very, very dangerous route and a very vain and a very narcissistic route that clearly the Sharia would not want you to do. So, bottom line, to conclude, in this, uh, in this, of this question to conclude, to perform a procedure to correct an aberration so that it looks normal. And by the way, this includes, you know, teeth, for example, right? If teeth are very crooked or whatnot, and you just get the, you know, the, the braces to look normal, you just get a normal smile, for example, right? That's something that inshallah ta'ala is uh, permissible. But to start changing your body, and to start fine tuning, uh, you know your 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 face and your weather and whatever, because you are not satisfied with what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave you. The general ruling in those would be that they are not allowed uh, for multiple reasons, and of them is that there's an element of narcissism, and of them that you're opening up the door for israf and being vainglorious and a type of vanity, uh, and of them is that the threat of shaitan will be apl uh, applicable uh, to you. Uh, and so with this, inshaAllah Taala, we come to the conclusion of uh, today's. Uh, lecture and inshallah I will see you next Tuesday. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna Allah wa 
ان الذين يؤذون الله ورسوله لعنهم الله في الدنيا والاخره واعد لهم عذابا مهينا والذين يؤذون المؤمنين والمؤمنات بغير ما اكتسبوا فقد احتملوا بهتانا واثما مبينا